Hi there, Tom Mason here. This is the Mini Sculpting Super Show, and I still have a cold. I've been wanting to do another sculptor interview for a long time, and recently I was able to line things up to be able to interview someone that's been on my list for a really, really long time. This is Bill Thornhill of Footsore Miniatures. I met Bill a while ago, as you'll see in the interview. He does great and amazing uh, Dark Age historical miniatures, and he's just a really cool, fun guy. So he's got some really unique experiences that he talks about and uh, shares a bit about how he approaches sculpting. So hope you enjoy the interview, and we'll be sure to see him and me if you will be at Adepticon here in about a week. Enjoy the interview. The Mini Sculpting Super Show is powered in part by Sculptomo Toys. See everything they have to offer at SculptomoToys.com. Hello and welcome to the Mini Sculpting Super Show. I'm here today with a very special interview with a sculptor who I met, I think it was, let me check my notes, four years ago mm -hmm. at Adepticon. Uh, his name is Bill Thornhill. He's, uh, are you the partner owner? What, what are you, Footsore I'm, I'm, Miniatures? I'm, I'm, I'm the owner of Footsore Miniatures. Owner of Footsore Miniatures, sculptor. You know, if you play Saga, you probably have seen or own tons of his miniatures. It's great stuff. So welcome, Bill. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Tom. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's great. And we're going to actually see each other again in about a week. We are, yeah. And be playing some Saga Indeed. at Adepticon. <laughs> I'm very excited for that. I hope they're my miniatures you've got. Oh yes, it is. Yeah, it's a whole Viking army. Well, you know, I did. I I had some of your stuff. I bought a little bit here and there, uh, but I was like many people waiting for the Vikings. Mm -hmm. So and you you got those done, and I bought them last year, and I'm uh, I'm finishing them up now. But they will be ready for the show. Awesome, so, awesome. Yeah, I'm very very excited. Great sculpts. I'll be I'll be, I'll be feeling Vikings myself. Vikings ah. in, the, in the doubles tournament. So. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> Cool. Well, yeah. So I met Bill four years ago, and you know I've I've been into sci-fi and fantasy miniatures for the most of my life, and obviously in my career. But I've always been interested in historicals, and that's what really drew me into to Bill's stuff. Obviously, because he does historicals. But I was just walking around um, back in 2015, and I saw his display. He had, I think an Irish war band and and some other ones, but the Irish one is what caught my eye. And um, just really drew me in, and he introduced me to Saga, and we got to talking about different sculpting techniques and everything. And so I wanted to bring him on the show and have him uh, talk to you guys because he's got a lot of great experience and um, some different perspectives because uh, than maybe what a lot of people are used to hearing because uh, of a focus on historicals. So, but before we get into all that, Bill, first question I have for you mm -hmm. is what kind of got you in? to this hobby you know as a as a gamer that and everything well i'm i'm gonna guess now but i think it was probably about 1989 88 or 89 and i was in the army um i was posted to um west germany at the time uh, in a place called munster and um one weekend uh my buddy who i shared a room with he had um He'd left a copy of uh, Warhammer Rogue Trader, the original 40K book, on his bed, and he disappeared for the weekend. And I was kind of pottering around, and I'd not really paid any attention to it. And then I saw it. I was like, oh, what's this? So I sat there. I picked it up and sat on my bed and basically just devoured this book for the rest of the day. Um, and I was completely entranced by it, the whole idea of, of a game with miniatures. Um, now, I was, I was fully familiar with Games Workshop because I'd actually um, um, done um, bits of artwork for them, but I'd just not really paid any attention to the games. So um, I kind of, um, I just got, like say, entranced by it, and I was due to go on leave a couple of weeks later. So when I went on leave, I basically took a big chunk of money I had and went into Games Workshop and went nuts. Uh, and I came back with a whole bunch of Space Orcs and a whole bunch of the plastic Womble Space Marines and um, and also other like bits of Warhammer. I didn't really know what I was buying. I was just buying whichever miniatures I liked at the time. So I had War Dancers and all sorts of stuff. And um, 
my buddy, uh, he'd gone on leave at the same time. He went away and he bought some stuff. And we ended up um, playing on the, the room of our dorm. And there'd be guys walking past, you know, they were going out on the booze on a, on a Saturday night and we'd be there <laughs> playing Warhammer on, on the floor, um, you know, and bluffing our way saying, you know, oh, it was just, you know, practicing tactics, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great what nonsense. but uh, ever since that i was completely hooked um and uh, not long after I, I got married uh, and i moved out and that's pretty much what i did uh you know of an evening i just sit and paint miniatures um i got um so into it that um i went and put a notice on the garrison um notice board asking if there was any one that played war games and uh, you know if if they fancied starting a kind of club um and i expected maybe one or two people might come out uh the first person that got hold of me was was a major uh who uh, and i was only a trooper at the time um so that was kind of weird um, <laughs> um but um uh and he had uh, a friend of his who was a captain that was into it as well uh and then there was a sergeant from the grenadier guards who got hold of me and he was into napoleonics and and I thought, right, well, we're going to need a place to kind of start this little group. So I went and saw my quartermaster, who was good enough to give us a room underneath one of the blocks in the cellars. Uh, and so I put up a notice saying, you know, uh, whatever day it was, you know, at seven o'clock, we'll all meet up, uh, expecting about five or six people there. And there was like 25 people turned up. Uh, and I was just like blown away, like all of these, you know, war gamers that I had no idea existed. Um, just came out of the woodwork. So that was kind of cool. Um, and yeah, and I just get, and that was it. I was completely sucked in then. So I was I was big on playing uh, Warhammer for a long time. Uh, Epic uh, Space Marine, that was another big one we played. Uh, we then moved on to Fantasy Battle. We played a lot of Fantasy Battle as well. And I always remember being at um, a, a small convention over there in, in uh, Germany. Because uh, the army had its own conventions, they had a two, I think, two a year. Uh, and I was at one, and we were playing Epic Space Marine on this big table. And the next table, there was a an American Civil War game going on. And I always remember um, the the guys, you know, there's lots of banter goes back and forth. And they always <laughs> always turned around. Uh, always remember, he turned around to me and said, "Well, come back and see me when you're playing proper war games." <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of brushed it off, but you know, years later, you kind of, uh, I'd got burnt out on 40k and, and workshop and stuff, and, and the ethos of the company had changed, so I kind of, that kind of put me off a little bit. And so I did, I, I switched over to historical war games. I, I started with um, seventh edition um, uh, war games, ancient rules, uh, which I didn't particularly like, and I went on to uh, DBM. Uh, all, all of this was in 15 at the time. Um, and then just kind of went on from there. Um, and it's just, it's not really stopped. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, that brings me to the next question. So obviously, it's 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 in your blood. It's something you love. So how did you, tell, tell me your story. I mean, you've told me this story before, but tell mm -hmm. our viewers your story of how you got into it uh, more from the business side of um, things, you know, and, and ended up owning your own miniatures company that's probably i mean maybe i'm wrong but to me it seems like one of the most well known uh for historical with dark ages specifically saga out well, there I'll, I'll 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 put the be well known bit down to andy hobday and his, his awesome marketing <laughs> rather than me because <laughs> he's really kind of picked up uh footsore and developed it into uh, a bigger brand than it was um but um, yeah, this, it was kind of a bizarre way I, I got into it, really. Um, what happened was I left the army in 99, and um, I got a job uh, in IT uh, with British Telecom. And after six weeks in this job, um, I looked up from my monitor. Uh, I was in first line support, tech support. I looked up from my monitor. All I could see was like these banks of monitors, all these little heads bobbing down. Uh, and and the thought that was in my head was, I feel like a battery chicken. And I just knew a, a battery chicken, you know, a chicken okay. in a battery bar. And um, 
uh, and I just thought oh, this this just isn't for me. Uh, and at the time, uh, I I had uh, I was painting figures for people, and I had one customer in London who was a who was a real geezer. He was like straight out of a Guy Ritchie movie, you know, straight out of you know lock, stock and two smoking barrels. This guy, I kid you not. Um, uh, and he'd always pay me in cash, and he'd always bring a big roll of. 20 pound notes and he just peel these <laughs> huge amounts of money off of me and he'd always pay me double what i charge him oh wow uh and he was into napoleonics that was his thing so um i thought with what that guy's paying me I, I don't need to work here so i basically quit my job and i became a freelance painter uh and i sent a couple of samples off to wargames foundry to see whether they'd like to, you know, hire me as a painter, uh, which they did. They gave me a, a, a plenty of figures to, to paint for them. Uh, one of the figures that they wanted me to paint, or some of the figures they wanted to paint, were the the new, they, they were the then new um, Prussian Seven Years' War figures that they were bringing out. But they wanted them painted in a specific blue, simply because of how it reproduced when they printed them in the, in the advert. So um, they told me I had to get in touch with. Uh, this guy called Nick Collier, who was one of their sculptors. Uh, and he had a figure that he would send to me, uh, which was painted by Kev Dallimore, who's a, who's a very well-known painter. Mm -hmm. And that had the right blue for, for the Prussian coats. <laughs> so I phoned Nick up, and we were chatting away. Really nice guy. Uh, and I said, you know, I've always been kind of fascinated with the whole sculpting thing. Um, I was telling him, you know, how much I, I love the work he'd already done. And... Um, he um, he said, oh, well, it's not that much different from painting. It's just like painting in 3D, really. And I said, well, I've tried it with Milliput and I've you know played around. And I said, I'm not, I can't do it. I'm, I don't know how, how you do it. Uh, he said, well, um, he was coming down to Wales, which is where I lived at the time, uh, a, a week later. So he invited me to where he was staying. Um, so I went up and met him and his family. Uh, and I stayed there overnight. Uh, and we basically just chatted all night. And he he sat down because he he worked wherever he went anyway. And he sat down and he showed me how he moved the putty around. And it was just the simple fact of someone showing me how to move green stuff around that the light bulb went on in my head. Because um, I was trying to carve it and and mm -hmm. you know and and shape it with my fingers and all. I had no idea what I was doing really. But once I saw someone. Show me the actual let you know, you push it this way, then you push it that way, then you push it back again, and then you push it this way, and you push it that way until the shape falls. Until someone showed me that, I had no idea. But it was like, like I say, the light bulb went off my head, and I went away and I practiced like that. And I sent him a couple of figures, and he said, Actually, these are pretty good. Um, they weren't whole figures, sorry, they were conversions. He, he taught me how to add arms to bodies and things like that. So then he invited me up to Newcastle, uh, where he lived. And I went up there for a long weekend. Uh, and it was exhausting because we basically sculpted from nine in the morning till about two in the morning, just sat there wow. pushing putty around. And it was, it was a proper boot camp. <laughs> 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 but I learned all this fantastic knowledge. You know, I'll always be forever in depth to Nick for, for sharing that with me. Um, so I carried on with the painting and just practiced a bit of the pushing putty around. Um, in fact, he, I did a, a Russian commissar uh, using the dolls that he had, uh, which is basically a doll is basically the, the legs and the, the torso of a miniature. And I made a Russian commissar kind of stood there with his arms folded and he had a machine gun, you know, slung over his shoulder kind of thing. And I sent it to Nick. Nick threw it in. Uh, with his work that he was doing for Black Tree uh, Miniatures at the time. And uh, they never noticed the difference. Oh, that's and they awesome. Just thought, they just said, oh, we just thought it was odd that there was just this one figure. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, a, that was a real kind of morale boost, really. Um, so, yeah, I carried on with the painting. And then Foundry advertised for a, a trainee sculptor. So, obviously, the first thing I did was apply for that. And I sent them a test piece in, and it was... a um, it was a Fagin from Oliver Twist. I basically had this this Fagin-like character, like sprinting down the, the road with a with a you know a bag of you know swag in his hand. Um, 
I know it was actually a good piece, but my my execution of you know smoothing out clothing and and refining it wasn't quite there yet. So I didn't get the position. Um, another very talented sculptor called Dave Thomas got it. Um, but they offered me the job of master mold maker. Um, and with the promise that, you know, like in 12 months time, once Dave is no longer the trainee, I would become a trainee. Mm. So um, I I just went for it. Because um, why wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So Brian Ansel taught me uh, mold making uh, and casting. Uh, and um, and I worked at Foundry for, I think, about 14 months or something. And, and uh, there was... There was a bit of a, a kind of head to head at the end of it, not with Brian, but with, with the then studio manager. Um, and I left. Um, and I left, though, with, with this massive wealth of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I kept practicing my sculpting till I was at a competent level. Um, and I had, I had the, the, the manufacturing and production kind of tied down. So I went away. Uh, saved lots of money, and I bought myself a vulcanizing press and a casting machine. And um, and I, I I did a bit of freelance work for mold making and things like that. But which <laughs> one of the funny stories with that was a guy called Mark Sims who owns Crusader Miniatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark gave me some of his 1940s British to to mold make, um, and I was like, oh yeah, that's not a problem. And I forgot to put. Uh, I, I forgot to put the uh, the to talc molds before I put them in, uh, which meant that what you do uh, just to explain to the people out there is you, the mold is two pieces of rubber. You put the miniatures in there and make a sandwich, but so then r- that rubber under the heat and pressure doesn't glue together. You basically put talc and powder on each side of the mold, and then it's got a, a, a kind of it acts as a release agent for it. Well, without that. The whole mold just welds together in one big block of rubber. So I had to dig, and, and if you want to know, if you want to know what hard work on your hands is like, try digging out figures from vulcanized rubber. Basically, you're digging into a tire with a scalpel and trying to get these figures out. And I was like mortified because it was the first job he gave me, and he was like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." But he kind of blew it off, and he basically put them back together, and they had them back to me within a week. And I did a better job there. <laughs> After that, <laughs> so um, so yeah, from there I just kind of carried on practicing, and um, I was into Warhammer Ancient Battles at that time because um, I'd switched over to completely to kind of historicals, and um, I wanted an Arab army, and there was nothing out there that really kind of you know picked my interest. Nothing I, I liked aesthetically, um, so I thought, well, why not just sculpt them? I'll just cast them up for myself, which I did. And um, I was chatting to a guy who owned a terrain business uh, uh, at the time. Uh, and we were kind of good mates. And uh, he said, well, give me some of the figures and I'll, I'll take them to Salute and see whether I can sell it. I was like, sure. Uh, not really thinking anything of it. But he called me up on the Monday after the weekend and he said, oh, you know, I made 185 quid for you. And I was like, wow. Wow, I made some money. I only had a handful of figures at the time. I was like, wow, that's really good. So that was it. That was the catalyst. I just kept on sculpting, and, and eventually uh, that grew into Musketeer Miniatures, which was my first company. Um, and then um, that ran for until I think around about 90, no, sorry, 2011 when I moved over here to America. Um, Oh, no, it ran a bit longer than that, actually, because Griffin Beast uh, ran with it for a couple of years. Mm. Um, but then that, that, um, that business relationship ended, and in that time, I'd started another company over here, which was Futsal Miniatures. Um, so then we integrated Mus- Musketeer Miniatures into Futsal Miniatures, and that's where we are today. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> I just think it's so cool that you're able to get in with war games foundry and get that sort of training and it's just neat to see how it all kind of slowly built those work over years mm-hmm. i was very yeah, lucky uh, i was very lucky with the with the people i knew um at the time uh, war games um foundry 
had um, some really very talented sculptors with them. Um, the Perrys had just left, so I didn't really get to meet the Perrys while they were working there. Um, but people like Mike Owen of Artisan uh, Miniatures, um, uh, Mark Sims of Crusader Miniatures, Shane Hoyle, who did all the street violence stuff for Foundry, um, all these people were still working there, and I got to know them. And, and they were all very good. They, they, you know, let me watch them sculpt and push putty around, and, and you know, I could ask questions, and they'd, um, you know, they'd, they'd be quite happily answer, sure. you know, anything I had. Um, and in quiet times between, kind of, you know, uh, making molds and casting, I'd, I'd be able to push a bit of putty around myself. So uh, I was very lucky in that sense. Um, um, I think the, the the biggest look though was was getting in touch with Nick Collier, who was uh, he does pretty much everything for the uh, Renaissance range for um, this old group miniatures. Um, uh, he he's a, a, an awesome sculptor, he really is. Um, very methodical, very kind of, and he he taught me the whole process of making you know miniatures, you know for for historical war games. That's a really great segue to my next question. So, <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, you know this channel and, and what I do, it's typically been focused on fantasy and science fiction, and it seems to be a lot of what's out there, at least what's in people's mind's eye when they're they're thinking and talking about stuff. But but obviously, there's a huge um, industry for historicals and everything. So, mm -hmm. can you tell me what what are some maybe some differences? about ways to go about approaching sculpting or, or things you need to consider if you're working on historicals versus, you know, a fantasy miniature where you can kind of do whatever the heck you want. Um, it depends on the, it really depends on the era that you're going to try and do. Uh, I think I copped out a little bit because I do the dark ages, which to be honest with you is, is almost pseudo fantasy anyway. Uh, because we don't, you know, it's called the Dark Ages for a reason. We do, we're in the dark about a lot of it. Uh, and and as far as things like, uh, you know, uh, what they wore and uh, into battle and you know, helmet designs and, you know, uh, all this kind of stuff, a lot of it is, it's, you know, our best guess. I mean, obviously we have evidence, but the chances are not everyone wore a helmet like that because that would have been a, a, a particular craftsman's work. Uh, and I know styles would have been in, and, you know, the, the, you know the, the, we know that Normans wore these conical helmets with, with their nose guards, and that was quite common. Uh, but they also wore them without nose guards. They also wore rounded helmets. There, there, there was a whole, you know, it depends what you had. A helmet was made out of, of iron or steel. Uh, that was a valuable commodity back in the Dark Ages. So you wouldn't throw it away because it was out of fashion. Someone else would wear it. Mm. So you would still have, you know, the, you know, they probably were like family heirlooms if they passed down yeah. to, to other people or, you know. Um, so I kind of copped out with, with dark ages because I get to make up. I, I, there's a lot of artistic license to be had. If you're going to do something like further, uh, further down the timeline um, or up the timeline, huh? which way we're going. Up the timeline. So if you go, we get something that's more, much more, you know, uniformed. Uh, let's say from the 17th century onward. Uh, one, the the records are better. Uh, for you know, we've got illustrations from the time, contemporary pictures, as well as descriptions. So you're you're kind of well fed with what people would have looked like. So you can do a lot of research for that kind of period, uh, and get you know a really good idea of what you're going to create. Um, you know, down on a bit of paper and then you can recreate it in, in putty. Um, but like I say, I, I, I copped out with the Dark Ages quite unintentionally, to be honest with you. Uh, I just happened to like the Dark Ages. Um, but, you know, now I think back at it, I was just like, well, I actually got away with not having to overly <laughs> research stuff, you know. As long as you get the stuff that people um, are expecting right, you can then wiggle it a bit, you know, here and there. So. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so with, uh, I mean, any army game, you need lots of troops, but with historicals, it seems like um, it, it's typically an army game, and people want, they don't want to just have the same guy holding the spear like this or sword, and, you know, they want to have variety. So 
with that, and especially because, you know, I've noticed that historical miniatures tend to sell for less, even though they're the same amount of metal, the same, like they look just as good as any fantasy miniature, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason. So what, what are some uh, tricks and tips and ways you go about um, getting that variety, but without having to take that painstaking time to, you know, just pour yourself into one single miniature and then, oh, crap, now I got to do another 16. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, uh, this this was um, you know this was something I was taught when I was at Foundry. Um, if any of your uh, listeners are familiar with uh, the ranges that Mark Copleston did, and also Nick Collier and Steve Sauer, uh, and and these ranges I'm specifically talking about are the Greeks, the Macedonians, and the Germans, the the, the early Germans, uh, and also the Caesarian Romans. If you go back and look at those figures, you will see that each range usually doesn't have any more than like four leg poses. Uh, and and the, the technique that, that they use is you basically make a set of legs with a torso. You then take that and make a mold of it. You cast them up into um, what they call uh, doll masters. Um, and these are usually made out of pewter, so it's a harder metal, um, just so they'll withstand a bit of you know, work. And then you build your figures on that. Um, most of the hard work's done because your legs are done, the torso's done. You might have to shave a little bit off here and there on the torso to get the physique right. But basically, there's a good chunk of your work done already. So then you would just basically put a head on it, you put the arms on it, and you dress it. Uh, and it's a much quicker process. And you only need three or four figures with a slightly different pose to create a whole... Uh, you see, Brian Ansel described it as the wave. So when you look down a rank, uh, if you look down a line of figures, you want to see a wave. You don't want to see them all pointing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So if you have four different kind of figures, or even three, um, you can create that wave whereby the line looks broken. And even if they're kind of fairly uniform, like, you know, Romans, um, you can still create that wave. You change the helmets up a little bit, you add some with plumes, or you, you just change the arm pose a little bit, or you have them leaning slightly more back or forward. But you have that wave, and that creates the aesthetic that a lot of gamers want, which is a unit that looks as though it's full of individuals. Um, and I basically took the same approach with, um, with certainly with futsal, less so with, well, no, I did do it with musketeer, but I did it more so with futsal because I, I introduced a bigger variety. And my aim was to create enough figures, um, certainly with the, the later ranges, that you could have almost a whole unit of like 24 figures, 20 figures, and they'd all be different. So I took that, I took, I, I created uh, four figure poses um, and built everything on them. But if you put a unit of Irish out there or a unit of Picts, um, a unit of Vikings, you don't, you, your eye doesn't go to the fact that there's four, only four poses there. Your eye goes to the fact that they all look different, you know? So Absolutely. That, that, that's, that's the, that's where I learned from, from my days at War Games Foundry is that, um, that, that wave, if you like, that's what you want, not a wave. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing that you do it with just a base of four, because I, you know, like you said, when I first saw it, I had no idea that that was happening at all. But then when I got some of the packs and was looking at them closer, I'm like, wait a second, I think this guy's a little similar. But, but like, it was very, it was actually hard for me to tell, just because those other little changes just made them all look so different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very, very cool technique. It's, 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 um, it's the way um, you know I've been able to produce relatively large ranges. Um, if you go to a lot of earlier ranges that are on the same kind of period, you'll see that they. And this is no criticism for any other manufacturer or sculptor. It's just that you know if you've only got four figures for your warriors or eight figures for your warriors, that's all. You, you're always going to be doubling up in a unit, and everyone likes a bit. Of, Change, you know, a bit, a bit of difference, uh, and that's really. But my, my my ethos of creating units was I'm really creating for myself, not for the customer. Um, so I basically make what I want for my unit, 
the customer just benefits from my <laughs> anal retentiveness. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, that, that's, that, that's what comes out of that, really. Um, but I kind of, um, uh, I enjoy doing the character figures because that's, that's when you can really kind of labor on the figure and, and create something a bit different. Um, doing the Berserkers for the Vikings, I really enjoyed that because um, uh, I just decided I was going to do something very different for them, um, making multi-part figures rather than just, you know, normal single figures. So that was kind of fun. And they look good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I haven't got a set myself. Oh. <laughs> Ironically, no. We're fe- we're- it was, a, it was a conversation last night with with uh, me and my uh, my buddy Ryan, who who comes to Adepticon uh, with me, um, and we're doing the doubles tournament. And um, he said, um, have, "Have you got berserkers?" And I went, "No, I haven't. Actually, I don't have any berserkers. They're all in the UK. So I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm probably going to be the one there with Viking berserkers that are not going to be my own figures, which is kind of you know, sadly ironic." <laughs> <laughs> So, with that kind of on that note, what uh, what is the f- your favorite sculpt or range that you've ever sculpted, and maybe Ooh. why? Mm. It's always hard to pick the babies, but it's... I, I'd say that my favorite range is probably the Iris, the Dark Age Iris, simply because I like playing with them because um, they're annoying, <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're just a fun range. So, so I'd say that, that my favorite range is definitely that. Um, although I am kind of, I do like the, the late Romans as well, but I'd redo some of the things with them. I think if I redo them <laughs> now. Um, favorite figure, that's a tough one. Um, the Ayala figure is probably one of my favorites, I think. Mm. Uh, the Saxon King. Um, yes, that is a great figure. That's, that's probably one of, that for me is one of the ones that, that just looks the part. But I'm mm. sure you're familiar with it with your sculpts. You you always mostly hate them, um, yeah. and then there's one or two that will stand out, and you'll go, "Yeah, I got it right there." Yeah. <laughs> so that's probably, that, that's so probably one. Armies. Sorry. I want to use him in so many different armies. Just <laughs> just so perfect. Well, that and that's another great thing about the Dark Ages is is mm-hmm. you know you can multi-purpose most of your figures. You really can, you know. Um, so. Yeah, why not? Just have them in everything. (laughs) All right. Well, I only have one last question, and that's if you have any – I know you just finished the Huns or are just about to finish the Huns. Do you have any other upcoming projects you'd like to talk about or Um, or Yeah. um, Well, yeah, the last last Hun figures uh, uh, is going to be Attila, a little diorama with Attila on it, Um, and um, maybe a couple of additions for the – the horse archers um but then i'm basically taking a, a bit of a break from dark ages uh, and i'm going to be learning uh or teaching myself rather um 3d sculpting um he means so, digital sculpting everybody digital sculpting. Sculpting. sorry i'm, I'm, I'm always I'm just I, don't, I don't know what personal <laughs> pet peeve bit of mine that i like to tease people about <laughs> no 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 it's, it's true it's true i mean i mean i already 3d sculpt i mean yeah i mean yep. <laughs> you're totally right there um so um yeah my aim is is to to spend uh the next year or so getting my head around digital sculpting which i've been playing with on and off for the past kind of six or eight months uh, but I've never really been able to sit down and concentrate on it, <clears throat> which is something that I'm giving myself time to do now. Yeah, it makes uh, a difference. But it's hard. It's hard to switch back and forth as somebody who's been kind of doing that myself for a while. Uh, it's very hard to switch back and forth. Yeah, I think that's really why I wanted to kind of clear the decks with the with the normal putty sculpting and and not have that as a distraction. Um, so I bought myself a course by a guy called Shane Olsen. <laughs> Who does um, stylized characters for? Um, he's he's worked for Disney um, and and other companies. Um, and the reason I got the stylized character one, which is basically uh, when I say stylized, it means that they're almost cartoon like characters, is because the way I've I've been looking at what we produce as um, as uh, miniature um, sculptors, it is stylized. It has to be stylized. Because we can't really get down into the nitty gritty and create skin textures and all that kind of stuff, because it won't show up on a miniature. There's just no point. Even though you know programs like ZBrush will give us all that 
capacity to, you know, get down into a real minuter uh, of, of detail, we can't use it. It has to be stylized. It has to be simplified so it reproduces at 28 mil or 32 mil, whatever. So, um, so yeah, I've been kind of burying myself in that course, and um, I'm going to make some cartoon characters, and then I'm going to move, try and take what I learned from making them into more detailed kind of 28 mil, 32 mil sculpts. Awesome. And, um, and the, the plan is to is to not do an historical range of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm kind of, I, I kind of think I've done enough dark age ranges now. I've got an idea to make it, maybe another two little projects. Um, but after that, I think I need, I need to just, you know, creatively do something different. So I might look at do something kind of near future or sci-fi, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. That sounds very exciting. <laughs> I'm. I hope it will be. <laughs> I'll tell you more on the. I'll tell you more in the bar on that. Sounds great. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Well, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Bill. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Your, yeah, all your wisdom. And if anybody is going to be at Adepticon, be sure to stop by. Uh, is Footsore going to be at the War Games sharing? We will, with, we'll, we'll, we'll be, yeah, we'll be, we'll be sharing our booth space with Warlord again. Um, and. Um, uh, we'll be giving some good deals away um, uh, because it'll be probably my last working Adepticon. Uh, next time you see me at Adepticon, I'll be there just for fun. Uh, but I'm always there for fun anyway because it's a great show. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's my last working Adepticon. And, um, um, yeah, come along and say hello and, and see what we can, we can do for you. Awesome. Well, I'll be there. I hope everybody else will be too. All right, Bill. Well, thank you so much. And everybody else out there, remember, keep sculpting. Thanks for watching the Mini Sculpting Super Show. If you'd like to learn more about sculpting miniatures, subscribe and hit the notification button so you can find out whenever I post a new video or check out some of the other videos on screen. If you'd like to support the show, check out my Patreon or head on over to my web store at btommason.com.